Now, our first guest today is an MP, an A&E doctor, a mum of two, and somehow still has found the time to join us, mm -hmm. which is great. As a shadow, a former shadow minister for mental health, she's used to advocating for people in need. But when it comes to using her own voice, it hasn't always been so easy. Uh, Dr Rosena Allen Khan joins us now. Hi, Rosena. Hello. And I think... Thanks for having me. Oh, Woo! Oh, lovely to be here. Thank you. People are going to be slightly puzzled by me saying that, that you don't always find it easy to use your voice, or you haven't always, yeah. uh, because you're so vocal now. But this goes back to your childhood. It does, yes. Um, when, I was, when I was very young, I suffered some significant childhood trauma, which meant that I wasn't able to speak with fluency. I had a very significant stammer. Um, and actually, even just talking about it now makes me feel very vulnerable, because I've never spoken mm. about it publicly before. And um, I really struggled to get words out, words that began with certain letters. Um, it was when I was seven and eight, and then particularly bad when I was in secondary school between the ages of about 11 and 14, which was really traumatic because... I, yeah. Sorry, how did people, when you were that young and then in senior school, how did people react to that? Pretty poorly, I think, because people don't understand. There's a lot of stigma around having a stammer. So I was bullied quite badly at school and things like reading out loud mm. in class. And I was really sporty. So back in the day, they would pick people to be captain that was sporty. And then I would traumatically have to point to people and pick people oh, so and say the their sport. names. Yeah. So, I, so, I'd, so I'd always try and pick people whose names didn't begin with a C or a T or a P oh. because I couldn't say yeah. words with those letters. And yeah. I... And I didn't speak about it for such a long time and and now I think to myself I have a job where you can't shut me up <laughs> you know for a living and actually the younger me never would have thought for a million years that I would be able to speak with fluency but for me it was really so important not to say that hey look that was then and hey look at me now I'm all better it's about saying how can we create the tolerant mm. society where mm. it's normal to live like that mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, what do, we, what do we understand about stammering? Because you said you suffered a significant childhood trauma. So do you link it to that rather than it being, a, you know, a speech development issue, which I think most people might think it to be? Well, I think there's so many different causes. And as a child, I don't think I really knew what was going on or why it was happening. I just knew that I was... Um, afraid to speak and that um, speaking didn't come easily and that people in shops would roll their eyes, walk away in the middle of my asking for something because it would take me so long. When I would try and use the phone, people would hang up because they would wonder what the strange noise was. And I think it was just very, very sort of difficult because people assumed I was nervous mm. and I wasn't and people that stammer aren't necessarily nervous but we do know that 80 percent of children that stammer are bullied in school mm. yeah. we know that eight percent of all children will at some point have some form of stammer in their life mm. and I do really genuinely think that if we had more presenters more um, actors and actresses more people you know in schools as teachers who had disfluency who had a stammer it would normalise it for yeah. all the people. Well, it's that interesting you say that because my ex-husband had a friend who was an actor who had a terrible, terrible stammer, stutter, off stage in the wings, could barely get two words out, went on stage, gone. A bit like Gareth Gates did, who of course yeah. brought it. To well, I used to sing. Singing. I, I, I did loads of music, and when I sang, I was completely fluent. I, I had no stammer when I sang, so I just sang more and more. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Yeah. When you say childhood trauma, I've just started a child poverty campaign in the North East because I've been horrified by the fact that in the place where I came from, in a borough like Biker, 62% of children are living below the yeah. poverty line. And developmental issues and stammering issues, of course, are very, are very, very prominent with that. And I'm just hoping that if we get rid of this government and get the next one in, that those sort of things <laughs> <laughs> will be um, addressed. <laughs> Um, and, and the things like child pop, because, of course, it's a ripple effect that you have children living in poverty, parents can't feed their children, yeah. then they can't access mental health help, yeah. especially the black community. Absolutely. And we know that adverse childhood experiences mm. is the single biggest driver of mental ill health in children and young people. And that if you were a young black man, and this disgusts me so much, if you were a young black man, you're four times more likely 
than everyone else to be diagnosed with mental ill health when you've already been arrested and entered the judicial system. That is so wrong. And there'll be people watching this programme today, there'll be people, you know, thinking, I can relate to that, I can't get my kids onto a CAMS waiting list, and when I'm on there, it's I'm just... on there for two years, yeah. and, you know, like, my By which time friend... it can be too late. Yeah, yeah, you know, like my best friend, who's a black man, he's a godfather to my, you know, children, he was told he had anger issues. He had depression, but he was told he had, you know, he had anger issues. We had to move him into our house. Rosanna, 20 away. years ago, I did a documentary in the Midlands, BBC uh, North West, called um, Mind Your Head. Yeah. And I found that being a black person in Birmingham 20 years ago, they couldn't access the medication. S schizophrenia was off the scale. People were being imprisoned. Once those schizophrenics got the drugs, they were living a normal life. And it's terrifying to think that 20 years on, things are still, still the same. They are still the same. They are still the same, and it is heartbreaking because law that can make it better, that we've discussed in Parliament on a cross-party basis, all parties that had representatives at certain committees, we saw how wrong it was, we advocated for change, and there has been no movement on that. Yeah. So I wanted, um, I wanted to ask about the sort of correct language around stammering, because that is something that I think can help if you meet somebody in a shop yeah. that is struggling or having a difficult time and having that patience and the right language to use around stammering. What would you advise in that situation? Well, I think, first of all, if you come across anyone that's stammering, it's important to just be patient and to let them finish speaking um, and make them feel as though they are welcome in that space. Then I think it's really important to understand that people that have stammers aren't victims. You're not suffering from having a stammer. Um, you are not uh, debilitated. Mm. Um, it should be accepted as a normal part of life, a normal way to live. And I think, I mean, I'll be really honest with you. I, I'm in Parliament sometimes and I'm standing at the dispatch box, which is where you make your speeches on the front bench, and sometimes I look at my speech and I see certain letters and even now I think to myself, shall I change the sentence? Shall I change the sentence so that I don't feel scared saying that letter? All these years later, because the scars don't leave you when you're treated a certain way, but what I should be thinking is, do you know what, it doesn't matter because I'm in a space where even if I am disfluent, even if I do stammer right now, then I'm not going to be judged. Mm. And people are going to say, isn't it... <laughs> And then, of course, Matt Hancock might tell you to watch your tone. Are you watching your friend and mine, Matt Hancock, Listen, in his fabulous that, series? That man, that man tried to ask me to watch my tone a little while ago. It didn't end I well know. for him. <laughs> and, um, please. And, um, but ultimately, I think, look, I'm not watching him. Um, he, he's, he's living his best life. Good luck to him. I don't, I don't wish him any ill. I think, though, having... Having a job like that, you know, while you're a politician, like, I think representing your community is the greatest honour you can have, and it's a, a, a full-time job. And if you're going to go off and do something that takes such a significant amount of time, you do have to think about the knock-on impact that that has. But I'm not going to lie, you know, if Strictly call me, <laughs> I'm answering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, it's a good show for him to be in. Yeah. They basically torture you for 13 weeks. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, Denise is watching it on repeat. <laughs> uh, Rosanna, thank you so much thank for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.